Teenage savages go wild in a juvenile jungle of lust and lawlessness. Here on the Ferris Wheel, we like to dig deeper and explore the historical importance of some of classic rock's legendary albums and why they achieved such a status in rock history. Today we revisit 1971's Concert for Bangladesh, an era-defining event and live album that set the template for the large-scale benefit concerts as we know them today, and the album has also hit the half-century mark this year. Before we explore the album itself, we need to give you a little historical context. What you have to know is that in the spring of 1965, the Beatles were roped into filming a movie in support of their upcoming album Help, thanks to a contract that they had signed a few years prior that had given us a hard day's night. To say that the plot has not aged well would be an understatement. For example, if you read the DVD box, the story is basically Ringo Starr gets a ring belonging to a group of oriental mystiques and wacky antics ensue. So already from the get-go, you have a really good idea of what type of movie this is. That being said, the band, perpetually stoned out of their mind, did not particularly enjoy making this movie. But for one of them, it was actually very transformative. And you can guess which one of them I'm talking about. Of course, George Harrison. Although he was called the Quiet Beetle, it would be more honest to call him the Searching Beetle, because while filming a scene in this movie set in an Indian restaurant, Harrison was playing around with a sitar that one of the hired background performers had brought, and he was completely fascinated, decided to purchase one of his own, and brought it to studio for Rubber Soul the next day. He started playing around with it, and it ended up on Norwegian wood, This Bird Has Flown, which was one of John Lennon's best-known Harrison and the Beatles were not the first Western musicians to find inspiration in Indian classical music. We've covered this in a previous episode. John Coltrane and Philip Glass are both very well known to have studied the Tala and its metric cycles, but other rock bands like the Yardbird, the Kinks, and the Birds also use their guitar to emulate the sitar's its distinctive tones. That being said, Beatlemania being what it was, anything that the members dabbled in became a cultural phenomenon, and thus Norwegian Wood helped kick off the popularity of what was called Raga Rock, which was a brief fad for Western pop that was basically using some aspects of Indian musical and spiritual concepts without necessarily understanding what they stood for. At the same time, master sitarist and composer Ravi Shankar was also experiencing his own surge of Western popularity thanks to both classical and countercultural spheres. He performed at both the Lincoln Center and the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. But what you have to know is that in that year, when he was asked what he thought of Norwegian Wood by a reporter in the music press, he famously said, if George Harrison wants to play the sitar, why does he not learn to play, play it properly? This was actually a very interesting thing because only a few months later, the pair met and discovered they were kindred spirits. Shankar began instructing Harrison on melodic structure and playing techniques, as well as the underlying spiritual discipline. This had a huge impact on Harrison, whose interest grew more sincere as he was leaving the drugs a little behind, and he became so preoccupied with the sitar that he essentially abandoned the guitar for a very short period, but that's rather interesting because he's so well known as a guitarist. What you also have to know, this is the period where fame was starting to really be heavy on his shoulders, and he had lost a lot of interest in the Beatles due to the power dynamics within the group and the fights between Lennon and McCartney. Harrison found new meeting in Indian classical music and philosophy. Times changed, the 60s ended, the Beatles broke up, and Western mainstream interest in Indian music started to subside, but Harrison stayed the course. His friendship with Shankar would prove to be one of music's richest collaborations. In the summer of 1971, the pair of them were in Los Angeles finishing the soundtrack of Raga, a documentary about Shankar's life that Harrison and Apple, the Beatles' multimedia conglomerate and had the computer company, were helping finance and distribute. But Shankar's mind was elsewhere because in March 1971, East Pakistan declared independence, adopting the name of Bangladesh, and West Pakistan responded with a brutal attempt to quell the movement for autonomy. Over the next nine months, between 300,000 and 3 million Bangladeshi people were killed in a military and militia campaign that has since been recognized as a genocide. Millions of refugees poured into India, straining what was already an exhausted system. As in Bengali himself, Shankar wanted to plan a benefit concert so that he could raise awareness and funds for the refugees. He hoped that some of his famous friends, maybe Harrison, and he even thought of Peter Sellers, might be willing to introduce the show and help bring in a little money, maybe something like $25,000 if he was lucky. 
What he didn't expect was that he, when he told Arison about the unfolding humanitarian crisis, the Beatle decided to volunteer his services. The first thing that Arison suggested was to bring in John Lennon. Ironically, you could say he wanted some help from his friends. Things moved rather quickly in 1971. Arison spent the following weeks planning the concert and enlisting friends to perform. And this is part of the legend. He consulted with an astrologer. It was decided that a concert for Bangladesh would take place on August 1st at Madison Square Garden. There would be two shows, an afternoon set and an evening set both of which were recorded for the album and film. Tickets were all $10 or less and basically sold out in a, in a few hours. The show were held at 2.30 and 8 p.m. It was planned that the concerts were followed by a best-selling live album, a box tree record set, and Apple Films concert documentary, which would open in cinemas in the spring of 1972. At the top of each performance, Arison would emerge to address the audience, which Shankar, he would ask them to listen to the performance of Indian music that opened the show with concentration and respect. So the musicians were Shankar and Sitar, Ali Akbar Khan on Sarod, Kamala Chakravarti on Tambura, and Ala Raka on Tabla. What you have to know is that there was a slight incident because uh, while they were tuning their instruments, the audience burst into applause. And Shankar dryly remarked uh, at the mic, thank you, if you appreciate the tuning so much, I hope you will enjoy the playing more. So it started off on a rather humorous note. It was followed by a 24-piece band that Harrison had recruited that included, amongst others, Ringo Starr, Eric Clapton, Leon Russell, Billy Preston, Klaus Vorman, the Apple band Bad Finger, a horn section, a seven-piece soul choir, and a lot more. All agreed to perform without a fee. Among Harrison's former bandmate, Len initially agreed to take part in the concert without his wife and musical partner, Yoko Ono, which was one of the few things Harrison had apparently stipulated. Then, Lennon had an argument with Ono as a result of this agreement and left New York in a rage two days before the concert. Starr's commitment has never been in question, and he even interrupted the filming of his movie Blind Man in Almeria in Spain in order to attend. Paul McCartney decided to decline to take part of the concert, however. He said he had bad feelings caused by the Beatles' legal problems on their breakup. He recently said that he thought it would was too soon after the breakup. Many versions of this exist. No one knows for sure. Basically, it comes down to the fact that he wasn't there. As the concert's organizer and main attraction, Erson was faced with a dilemma. Either f fade away in the background and only host, or go into the spotlight and put on a great show. From the opening riff, Arison decided he was all in, in a white two-piece suit, and he was radiant, and this is, was slightly outside of his normal character that we had seen up to this point, and he basically owned the stage. He's only 28 years old at this point. You also have to remember that Arison had not been in a live performance since 1966, since August 1966, which was the date at which the Beatles had stopped touring. One of the other guests, Bob Dylan, had also stopped touring more or less the same year, although in his case it was due to a motorcycle accident. He had had a modest comeback in August of 1969 at the Isle of Wight Festival, but he's still not, at this point in time, back in complete concert form. It's also the first time that Harrison would perform all the songs from All Things Must Pass, his triple album opus that he had released the year prior. During songs like My Sweet Lord and Awaiting on You All, you can hear the passion that he had for this phase of his life and what the philosophy that Shankar had introduced him to was doing to his self-confidence and to his view of the world. The concert was more or less arranged like a review, basically it was performances from the stars intermixed with showcases. You had things like That's the Way God Planned It that was done by a gospel rock song group. It was a really big success. It also passed into the legend that following the two sellout concerts, all the participants attended a party in the basement of a club that was known as Ungano's. And Dylan was on such a high, and I'm not talking a drug high, that he wanted to do another one. He said, God, if only we have done three shows. So it probably marks the point where both Arison and Dylan decided that they would start doing live gigs again. Although one can never be completely sure about these things, but that's the way some biographies have put it. The post-concert party also featured live performances from Harrison and Preston, and the other part of the legend was that Phil Spector 
was completely drunk, decided to play a unique version of Dadu Run Run, and that uh, Keat Moon actually showed up in the early hours of the morning and started smashing up the drum kit, which was not his. It was actually Mike Gibbons for Bad Fingers. So it's sort of the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s in terms of vibe. In a wider countercultural context, though, it was rather important because at this point in time, the post-Woodstock hippie vibe of the 60s had slightly rotten away. And so this actually created a moment where rock started evolving to its next phase. One of the things it did actually was to change the perception of recording artists, especially rock artists, that they could be good world citizens as well, and that they would set aside their egos and paychecks in order to help people who were suffering. There's actually an historian in Bangladesh, his name is Farida Majid, that said that the warm care and goodwill of the August 1971 concert echoed all over the world, inspiring volunteers to approach UNICEF and offer their assistance, as well as eliciting private donations to the Bangladesh Disaster Fund. So this is actually the point, and it's actually been confirmed by people like Bob Geldof, that you get the altruist spirit that would really start to show up a lot more in the 80s, like at Live Aid, Farm Aid, the concert for New York City, and Live 8. All of these can actually be traced to the concert for Bangladesh. And the, the other difference was that the Arison Shankar project was really responsible for identifying the problem and establishing Bangladesh in the minds of the mainstream Western societies. You have to remember there was no 24-hour coverage on, net, on news network. There were no news network. So they really, overnight, created a mass of people that became educated about geopolitical events through music. So you wonder maybe, what is the concert well attended? Well, it had a total of about 40,000 people at the initial gate, and they raised close to $250,000 for Bangladesh Relief, which was administered by UNICEF. After collecting the musician easily, Arison Doe found the record industry a lot harder to deal with because they had to release the rights for performers to share the stage, and millions of dollars raised for the albums and film were tied up in IRS tax accounts for years. But the concert for Bangladesh is recognized as highly successful and influential as an aid project, which generated both awareness and considerable funds, as well as providing valuable lessons and inspiration for future projects. Also, by 1985, through revenue raised by the live album, the film, it's estimated that $12 million had been sent to Bangladesh. And sales from the live album and DVD release of the film continue to benefit the George Harrison Fund for UNICEF to this day. So what's left of the concert for Bangladesh in the culture? Well, it's still there to a great degree. You have to remember, for example, back in the 90s and early 2000s, The Simpsons actually satirized it in two episodes. So the first one is like fodder, like clown, and then the other one is I'm with Cupid. The first one, Krusty plays the album while a visitor at the Simpson household listens on. And in I'm with Cupid, a Pooh's record collection contains the concert against Bangladesh, which features a picture of a mushroom cloud on the cover, reflecting Indian-Pakistani nuclear rivalry in the region. Also in 1974, the issue that came out in July of National Lampoon satirized it with a piece by Tom Wilkes. Two years before this, the National Lampoon team spoofed Erson's humanitarian role on record with their track The Concert in Bangladesh on the Radio Diner album. In the sketch, two Bangladeshi stand-up comedians played by Tony Enda and Christopher Guest performed of starving refugees in an attempt to collect a bowl full of rice so that George Harrison can mount a hunger strike. That has not aged well, I can tell you. I've listened to it. Crowd noises actually have been used on Aerosmith's cover of Train Kept a Rollin' by producer Jack Douglas. Some of stills photographer Barry Feinstein's shots from the 1971 concert were also used on some subsequent albums by the participating artists, especially Bob Dylan. So you can see it on Bob Dylan's Greatest Hits, Volume 2, and on the history of Eric Clapton. Finally, Harrison himself sent up the benefit show concept on film in 1985's handmade comedy Water. At the so-called concert for Casacra, he, Star Clapton, John Lord, and others make a surprise appearance on stage, supposedly before the United Nations General Assembly performing the song Freedom. So I encourage you to find a copy of this album, have a listen, Maybe not all the way through. Yeah, we never know. Maybe you're looking for your specific artist that you always loved. But it can be a very interesting experience to go through it 
and try to live the vibe of the 70s. This is Steven Wheeler, and this was a little history of rock legendary albums.